Section sixty four of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Vautrin's Last Avatar. Chapter thirteen. At this instant, the governor of the conciergerie came in, not without knocking and the private room of the public prosecutor is so well guarded that only those concerned about the courts may even knock at the door monsieur le comte said monsieur go the prisoner calling himself carlos herrera wishes to speak with you has he had communication with anybody asked monsieur de granville with all the prisoners for he has been out in the yard since about half past seven and he has seen the condemned man who would seem to have talked to him a speech of camusot's which recurred to his mind like a flash of light showed m de granville all the advantage that might be taken of a confession of intimacy between jacques collin and theodore calvi to obtain the letters the public prosecutor glad to have an excuse for postponing the execution beckoned m go to his side i intend said he to put off the execution till to-morrow but let no one in the prison suspect it absolute silence let the executioner seem to be superintending the preparations send the spanish priest here under a strong guard the spanish embassy claims his person gendarmes can bring up the self-styled carlos by your back stairs so that he may see no one instruct the men each to hold him by one arm and never let him go till they reach this door are you sure monsieur go that this dangerous foreigner has spoken to no one but the prisoners ah just as he came out of the condemned cell a lady came to see him the two magistrates exchanged looks and such looks what lady was that asked camusot one of his penitents a marquise replied go worse and worse said monsieur de granville looking at camusot she gave all the gendarmes and warders a sick headache said monsieur go much puzzled nothing can be a matter of indifference in your business said the public prosecutor the conciergerie has not such tremendous walls for nothing how did this lady get in with a regular permit monsieur replied the governor the lady beautifully dressed in a fine carriage with a footman and a chasseur came to see her confessor before going to the funeral of the poor young man whose body you had had removed bring me the order for admission said monsieur de granville it was given on the recommendation of the comte de serizy what was the woman like asked the public prosecutor she seemed to be a lady did you see her face she wore a black veil what did they say to each other well a pious person with a prayer-book in her hand what could she say she asked the abbe's blessing and went on her knees did they talk together a long time not five minutes but we none of us understood what they said they spoke spanish no doubt tell us everything monsieur the public prosecutor insisted i repeat the very smallest detail is to us of the first importance let this be a caution to you she was crying monsieur really weeping that we could not see she hid her face in her handkerchief she left three hundred francs in gold for the prisoners that was not she said camusot bibi lupin at once said she is a thief said monsieur go he knows the tribe said monsieur de Gonville. get out your warrant he added turning to camusot and have seals placed on everything in her house at once but how can she have got hold of monsieur de serizy's recommendation bring me the order and go monsieur go send me that abbe immediately 
so long as we have him safe the danger cannot be greater and in the course of two hours talk you get a long way into a man's mind especially such a public prosecutor as you are said camusot insidiously there will be two of us replied m de granville politely and he became discursive once more there ought to be created for every prison parlor a post of superintendent to be given with a good salary to the cleverest and most energetic police officers said he after a long pause bibi lupin ought to end his days in such a place then we should have an eye and ear on the watch in a department that needs closer supervision than it gets m go could tell us nothing positive he has so much to do said camusot still between these secret cells and us there lies a gap which ought not to exist on the way from the conciergerie to the judges rooms there are passages courtyards and stairs the attention of the agents cannot be unflagging whereas the prisoner is always alive to his own affairs i was told that a lady had already placed herself in the way of jacques collin when he was brought up from the cells to be examined that woman got into the guard-room at the top of the narrow stairs from the mouse-trap the ushers told me and i blamed the gendarmes oh the palais needs entire reconstruction said m de granville but it is an outlay of twenty to thirty million francs just try asking the chambers for thirty millions for the more decent accommodation of justice the sound of many footsteps and a clatter of arms fell on their ear it would be jacques collin the public prosecutor assumed a mask of gravity that hid the man camusot imitated his chief the office-boy opened the door and jacques collin came in quite calm and unmoved you wished to speak to me said m de granville i am ready to listen m le comte i am jacques collin i surrender camusot started the public prosecutor was immovable as you may suppose i have my reasons for doing this said jacques collin with an ironical glance at the two magistrates i must inconvenience you greatly for if i had remained a spanish priest you would simply have packed me off with an escort of gendarmes as far as the frontier by bayonne and there spanish bayonets would have relieved you of me the lawyers sat silent and imperturbable monsieur le comte the convict went on the reasons which have led me to this step are yet more pressing than this but devilish personal to myself i can tell them to no one but you if you are afraid afraid of whom of what said the comte de granville in attitude and expression in the turn of his head his demeanor and his look this distinguished judge was at this moment a living embodiment of the law which ought to supply us with the noblest examples of civic courage in this brief instant he was on a level with the magistrates of the old french parlement in the time of the civil wars when the presidents found themselves face to face with death and stood made of marble like the statues that commemorate them afraid to be alone with an escaped convict leave us monsieur camusot said the public prosecutor at once i was about to suggest that you should bind me hand and foot jacques collin coolly added with an ominous glare at the two gentlemen he paused and then said with great gravity monsieur le comte you had my esteem but you now command my admiration then you think you are formidable said the magistrate with a look of supreme contempt think myself formidable retorted the convict why think about it i am and i know it 
jacques collin took a chair and sat down with all the ease of a man who feels himself a match for his adversary in an interview where they would treat on equal terms at this instant monsieur camusot who was on the point of closing the door behind him turned back came up to monsieur de granville and handed him two folded papers look said he to monsieur de granville pointing to one of them call back monsieur gault cried the comte de granville as he read the name of madame de montfrigneuse's maid a woman he knew the governor of the prison came in describe the woman who came to see the prisoner said the public prosecutor in his ear short thick-set fat and square replied monsieur gault the woman to whom this permit was given is tall and thin said monsieur de granville how old was she about sixty this concerns me gentlemen said jacques collin come do not puzzle your heads that person is my aunt a very plausible aunt a woman and an old woman i can save you a great deal of trouble you will never find my aunt unless i choose if we beat about the bush we shall never get forwarder monsieur l'abbe has lost his spanish accent observed monsieur go he does not speak broken french because things are in a desperate mess my dear monsieur go replied jacques collin with a bitter smile as he addressed the governor by name monsieur go went quickly up to his chief and said in a whisper beware of that man monsieur le comte he is mad with rage monsieur de granville gazed slowly at jacques collin and saw that he was controlling himself but he saw too that what the governor said was true this treacherous demeanor covered the cold but terrible nervous irritation of a savage in jacques collin's eyes were the lurid fires of a volcanic eruption his fists were clenched he was a tiger gathering himself up to spring leave us said the count gravely to the prison governor and the judge you did wisely to send away lucien's murderer said jacques collin without caring whether camusot heard him or no i could not contain myself i should have strangled him monsieur de granville felt a chill never had he seen a man's eyes so full of blood or cheeks so colourless or muscles so set and what good would that murder have done you he quietly asked you avenge society or fancy you avenge it every day monsieur and you ask me to give a reason for revenge have you never felt vengeance throbbing in surges in your veins don't you know that it was that idiot of a judge who killed him for you were fond of my lucien and he loved you i know you by heart sir the dear boy would tell me everything at night when he came in i used to put him to bed as a nurse tucks up a child and i made him tell me everything he confided everything to me even his least sensations the best of mothers never loved an only son so tenderly as i loved that angel if only you knew all that is good sprang up in his heart as flowers grow in the fields he was weak it was his only fault weak as the string of a lyre which is so strong when it is taut these are the most beautiful natures their weakness is simply tenderness admiration the power of expanding in the sunshine of art of love of the beauty god has made for man in a thousand shapes in short lucien was a woman spoiled oh what could i not say to that brute beast who had just gone out of the room i tell you monsieur in my degree as a prisoner before his judge i did what god almighty would have done for his son if hoping to save him he had gone with him before pilate 
a flood of tears fell from the convict's light tawny eyes which just now had glared like those of a wolf starved by six months snow in the plains of the ukraine he went on that dolt would listen to nothing and he killed the boy i tell you sir i bathed the child's corpse in my tears crying out to the power i do not know and which is above us all i who do not believe in god for if i were not a materialist i should not be myself i have told everything when i say that you don't know no man knows what suffering is i alone know it the fire of anguish so dried up my tears that all last night i could not weep now i can because i feel that you can understand me i saw you sitting there just now an image of justice oh monsieur may god for i am beginning to believe in him preserve you from ever being as bereft as i am that cursed judge has robbed me of my soul monsieur le comte at this moment they are burying my life my beauty my virtue my conscience all my powers imagine a dog from which a chemist had extracted the blood that's me i am that dog and that is why i have come to tell you that i am jacques collin and to give myself up i made up my mind to it this morning when they came and carried away the body i was kissing like a madman like a mother as the virgin must have kissed jesus in the tomb i meant then to give myself up to justice without driving any bargain but now i must make one and you shall know why are you speaking to the judge or to monsieur de granville asked the magistrate the two men crime and law looked at each other the magistrate had been strongly moved by the convict he felt a sort of divine pity for the unhappy wretch he understood what his life and feelings were and besides the magistrate for a magistrate is always a magistrate knowing nothing of jacques collin's career since his escape from prison fancied that he could impress the criminal who after all had only been sentenced for forgery he would try the effect of generosity on this nature a compound like bronze of various elements of good and evil again m de granville who had reached the age of fifty-three without ever having been loved admired a tender soul as all men do who have not been loved this despair the lot of many men to whom women can only give esteem and friendship was perhaps the unknown bond on which a strong intimacy was based that united the comte de bauvan de granville and de serizy for a common misfortune brings souls into unison quite as much as a common joy you have the future before you said the public prosecutor with an inquisitorial glance at the dejected villain the man only expressed by a shrug the utmost indifference to his fate lucien made a will by which he leaves you three hundred thousand francs poor poor chap poor boy cried jacques collin always too honest i was all wickedness while he was goodness noble beautiful sublime such lovely souls cannot be spoiled he had taken nothing from me but my money sir this utter and complete surrender of his individuality which the magistrate vainly strove to rally so thoroughly proved his dreadful words that m de granville was won over to the criminal the public prosecutor remained 
if you really care for nothing said monsieur de granville what did you want to say to me well is it not something that i have given myself up you were getting warm but you had not got me besides you would not have known what to do with me what an antagonist said the magistrate to himself monsieur le comte you are about to cut off the head of an innocent man and i have discovered the culprit said jacques collin wiping away his tears i have come here not for their sakes but for yours i have come to spare you remorse for i love all who took an interest in lucien just as i will give my hatred full play against all who helped to cut off his life men or women what can a convict more or less matter to me he went on after a short pause a convict is no more in my eyes than an emmet is in yours i am like the italian brigands fine men they are if a traveller is worth ever so little more than the charge of their musket they shoot him dead i thought only of you i got the young man to make a clean breast of it he was bound to trust me we had been chained together theodore is very good stuff he thought he was doing his mistress a good turn by undertaking to sell or pawn stolen goods but he is no more guilty of the nanterre job than you are he is a corsican it is their way to revenge themselves and kill each other like flies in italy and spain a man's life is not respected and the reason is plain there we are believed to have a soul in our own image which survives us and lives for ever tell that to your analyst it is only among atheistical or philosophical nations that those who mar human life are made to pay so dearly and with reason from their point of view a belief only in matter and in the present if calvi had told you who the woman was from whom he obtained the stolen goods you would not have found the real murderer he is already in your hands but his accomplice whom poor theodore will not betray because she is a woman well every calling has its point of honour convicts and thieves have theirs now i know the murderer of those two women and the inventors of that bold strange plot i have been told every detail postpone calvi's execution and you shall know all but you must give me your word that he shall be sent safe back to the hulks and his punishment commuted a man so miserable as i am does not take the trouble to lie you know that what i have told you is the truth to you jacques collin though it is degrading justice which ought never to condescend to such a compromise i believe i may relax the rigidity of my office and refer the case to my superiors will you grant me this life possibly monsieur i implore you to give me your word it will be enough monsieur granville drew himself up with offended pride i hold in my hand the honour of three families and you only the lives of three convicts in yours said jacques collin i have the stronger hand but you may be sent back to the dark cells then what will you do said the public prosecutor oh we are to play the game out then said jacques collin i was speaking as man to man i was talking to monsieur de granville but if the public prosecutor is my adversary i take up the cards and hold them close and if only you had given me your word i was ready to give you back the letters that mademoiselle clotilde de grandlieu this was said with a tone an audacity and a look which showed monsieur de granville 
that against such an adversary the least blunder was dangerous and is that all you ask said the magistrate i will speak for myself now said jacques the honor of the grandlieu family is to pay for the commutation of theodore's sentence it is giving much to get very little for what is a convict in penal servitude for life if he escapes you can so easily settle the score it is drawing a bill on the guillotine only as he was consigned to wash for with no amiable intentions you must promise me that he shall be quartered at toulon and well treated there now for myself i want something more i have the packets of letters from madame de serizy and madame de maufrigneuse and what letters i tell you monsieur le comte prostitutes when they write letters assume a style of sentiment well sir fine ladies who are accustomed to style and sentiment all day long write as prostitutes behave philosophers may know the reasons for this contrariness i do not care to seek them woman is an inferior animal she is ruled by her instincts to my mind a woman has no beauty who is not like a man so your smart duchesses who are men in brains only write masterpieces oh they are splendid from beginning to end like piron's famous ode indeed would you like to see them said jacques collin with a laugh the magistrate felt ashamed i cannot give them to you to read but there no nonsense this is business and all above board i suppose you must give me back the letters and allow no one to play the spy or to follow or to watch the person who will bring them to me that will take time said monsieur de granville no it is half past nine replied jacques collin looking at the clock well in four minutes you will have a letter from each of these ladies and after reading them you will countermand the guillotine if matters were not as they are you would not see me taking things so easy the ladies indeed have had warning monsieur de granville was startled they must be making a stir by now they are going to bring the keeper of the seals into the fray they may even appeal to the king who knows come now will you give me your word that you will forget all that has passed and neither follow nor send any one to follow that person for a whole hour i promise it very well you are not the man to deceive an escaped convict you are a chip of the block of which touraine and conde are made and would keep your word to a thief in the salle des pas perdus there is at this moment a beggar woman in rags an old woman in the very middle of the hall she is probably gossiping with one of the public writers about some lawsuit over a party wall perhaps send your office messenger to fetch her saying these words dabor ti mandana the boss wants you she will come but do not be unnecessarily cruel either you accept my terms or you do not choose to be mixed up in a business with a convict i am only a forger you will remember well do not leave calvi to go through the terrors of preparation for the scaffold i have already countermanded the execution said monsieur de granville to jacques collin i would not have justice beneath you in dignity jacques collin looked at the public prosecutor with a sort of amazement and saw him ring his bell will you promise not to escape give me your words and i shall be satisfied go and fetch the woman the office-boy came in 
felix send away the gendarmes said m de granville jacques collin was conquered in this duel with the magistrate he had tried to be the superior the stronger the more magnanimous and the magistrate had crushed him at the same time the convict felt himself the superior inasmuch as he had tricked the law he had convinced it that the guilty man was innocent and had fought for a man's head and won it but this advantage must be unconfessed secret and hidden while the magistrate towered above him majestically in the eye of day End of section 64section sixty five of scenes from a courtesan's life by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary vautrin's last avatar chapter fourteen as jacques collin left m de granville's room the comte des lupoles secretary-in-chief of the president of the council and a deputy made his appearance and with him a feeble-looking little old man this individual wrapped in a puce-coloured overcoat as though it were still winter with powdered hair and a cold pale face had a gouty gait unsteady on feet that were shod with loose calfskin boots leaning on a gold-headed cane he carried his hat in his hand and wore a row of seven orders in his buttonhole what is it my dear des lupoles asked the public prosecutor i come from the prince replied the count in a low voice you have carte blanche if you can only get the letters madame de serizy's madame de montfrigneuse's and mademoiselle clotilde de grandlieu's you may come to some arrangement with this gentleman who is he asked monsieur de granville in a whisper there are no secrets between you and me my dear sir said des lupoles this is the famous corentin his majesty desires that you will yourself tell him all the details of this affair and the conditions of success do me the kindness replied the public prosecutor of going to tell the prince that the matter is settled that i have not needed this gentleman's assistance and he turned to corentin i will wait on his majesty for his commands with regard to the last steps in the matter which will lie with the keeper of the seals as two reprieves will need signing you have been wise to take the initiative said des lupoles shaking hands with the comte de granville on the very eve of a great undertaking the king is most anxious that the peers and the great families should not be shown up blown upon it ceases to be a low criminal case it becomes an affair of state but tell the prince that by the time you came it was all settled really i believe so then you my dear fellow will be keeper of the seals as soon as the present keeper is made chancellor i have no ambition replied the magistrate des lupoles laughed and went away beg of the prince to request the king to grant me ten minutes audience at about half past two added m de granville as he accompanied the comte des lupoles to the door so you are not ambitious said des lupoles with a keen look at m de granville come you have two children you would like at least to be made peer of france if you have the letters m le procureur general my intervention is unnecessary said corentin finding himself alone with m de granville who looked at him with very natural curiosity such a man as you can never be superfluous in so delicate a case replied the magistrate seeing that corentin had heard or guessed everything corentin bowed with a patronizing air do you know the man in question monsieur 
yes monsieur le comte it is jacques collin the head of the ten thousand francs association the banker for three penal settlements a convict who for the last five years has succeeded in concealing himself under the robe of the abbe carlos herrera how he ever came to be entrusted with a mission to the late king from the king of spain is a question which we have all puzzled ourselves with trying to answer i am now expecting information from madrid whither i have sent notes and a man that convict holds the secrets of two kings he is a man of mettle and temper we have only two courses open to us said the public prosecutor we must secure his fidelity or get him out of the way the same idea has struck us both and that is a great honor for me said corentin i am obliged to have so many ideas and for so many people that out of them all i ought occasionally to meet a clever man he spoke so dryly and in so icy a tone that m de granville made no reply and proceeded to attend to some pressing matters mademoiselle jacqueline collin's amazement on seeing jacques collin in the salle des pas perdus is beyond imagining she stood square on her feet her hands on her hips for she was dressed as a costermonger accustomed as she was to her nephew's conjuring tricks this beat everything well if you're going to stare at me as if i were a natural history show said jacques collin taking his aunt by the arm and leading her out of the hall we shall be taken for a pair of curious specimens they may take us into custody and then we should lose time and he went down the stairs of the galerie marchande leading to the rue de la barillerie where is paccard he is waiting for me at la russe's walking up and down the flower market and prudence also at her house as my goddaughter let us go there look round and see if we are watched la russe a hardware dealer living on the quai aux fleurs was the widow of a famous murderer one of the ten thousand in eighteen nineteen jacques collin had faithfully handed over twenty thousand francs and odd to this woman from her lover after he had been executed trompe la mort was the only person who knew of his pal's connection with the girl at that time a milliner i am your young man's boss the boarder at madame vauquer's had told her having sent for her to meet him at the jardin des plantes he may have mentioned me to you my dear any one who plays me false dies within a year on the other hand those who are true to me have nothing to fear from me i am staunch through thick and thin and would die without saying a word that would compromise anybody i wish well to stick to me as a soul sticks to the devil and you will find the benefit of it i promised your poor auguste that you should be happy he wanted to make you a rich woman and he got scragged for your sake don't cry listen to me no one in the world knows that you were mistress to a convict to the murderer they choked off last saturday and i shall never tell you are two and twenty and pretty and you have twenty-six thousand francs of your own forget auguste and get married be an honest woman if you can in return for peace and quiet i only ask you to serve me now and then me and any one i may send you but without stopping to think i will never ask you to do anything that can get you into trouble you or your children or your husband if you get one or your family in my line of life i often want a safe place to talk in or to hide in or i may want a trusty woman to carry a letter or do an errand you will be one of my letter-boxes one of my porter's lodges one of my messengers neither more nor less you are too red-haired auguste and i used to call you la russe you can keep that name my aunt an old clothes dealer at the temple who will come and see you is the only person in the world you are to obey tell her 
everything that happens to you. She will find you a husband, and be very useful to you. And thus the bargain was struck, a diabolical compact, like that which had for so long bound Prudence Servien to Jacques Collin, and which the man never failed to tighten, for, like the devil, he had a passion for recruiting. In about 1821 Jacques Collin found La Rousse a husband, in the person of the chief shopman under a rich wholesale tin merchant. This head clerk, having purchased his master's house of business, was now a prosperous man, the father of two children, and one of the district mayor's deputies. La Rousse, now Madame Prélard, had never had the smallest ground for complaint, either of Jacques Collin or of his aunt. Still, each time she was required to help them, Madame Prélard quaked in every limb. So, as she saw the terrible couple come into her shop, she turned as pale as death. "'We want to speak to you on business, madame,' said Jacques Collin. "'My husband is in there,' said she. "'Very well. We have no immediate need of you. I never put people out of their way for nothing.' "'Send for a hackney coach, my dear,' said Jacqueline Collin, "'and tell my goddaughter to come down. I hope to place her as maid to a very great lady, and the steward of the house will take us there.' A shop-boy fetched the coach, and a few minutes later Europe, or, to be rid of the name under which she had served Esther, Prudence Servien, Pacard, Jacques Collin, and his aunt, were— to la Rousse's great joy, packed into a coach, ordered by trompe la mort to drive to the Barrière d'Ivry. Prudence and Pacard, quaking in presence of the boss, felt like guilty souls in the presence of God. "'Where are the seven hundred and fifty thousand francs?' asked the boss, looking at them with the clear, penetrating gaze which so effectually curdled the blood of these tools of his, these âmes damnées, when they were caught tripping, that they felt as though their scalp were set with as many pins as hairs. "'The seven hundred and thirty thousand francs,' said Jacqueline Collin to her nephew, "'are quite safe. I gave them to La Romette this morning in a sealed packet.' If you had not handed them over to Jacqueline, said trompe la mort you would have gone straight there, and he pointed to the Place de Greve, which they were just passing. Prudence Servien, in her country fashion, made the sign of the cross, as if she had seen a thunderbolt fall. I forgive you, said the boss, on condition of your committing no more mistakes of this kind, and of your being henceforth to me what these two fingers are of my right hand, and he pointed to the first and middle fingers, for this good woman is the thumb, and he slapped his aunt on the shoulder. Listen to me, he went on. You, Pacard, have nothing more to fear. You may follow your nose about Pantin, Paris, as you please. I give you leave to marry Prudence Servien. Pacard took Jacques Collin's hand and kissed it respectfully. And what must I do? said he. Nothing, and you will have dividends and women to say nothing of your wife, for you have a touch of the regency about you, old boy, that comes of being such a fine man. Pacard colored under his sultan's ironical praises. You, Prudence, Jacques went on, will want a career, a position, a future. You must remain in my service. Listen to me. There is a very good house in the Rue Sainte-Barbe belonging to that Madame de Saint-Esteve, whose name my aunt occasionally borrows. It is a very good business, with plenty of custom, bringing in fifteen to twenty thousand francs a year. Saint-Esteve puts a woman in to keep the shop. La Gonore, said Jacqueline. Poor La Pareille's mall, said Pacard. That is where I bolted to with her op the day that poor Madame Van Bogsack died, our missus. Who jabbers when I am speaking? said Jacques Collin. Perfect silence fell in the coach. 
Paccard and Prudence did not dare look at each other. The shop is kept by La Gonore, Jacques Collin went on. If that is where you went to hide with Prudence, I see, Paccard, that you have wit enough to dodge the reelers, mislead the police, but not enough to puzzle the old lady, and he stroked his aunt's chin. Now I see how she managed to find you. It all fits beautifully. You may go back to La Conor. To go on, Jacqueline will arrange with Madame Nourrisson to purchase her business in the Rue Sainte Barbe and if you manage well child you may make a fortune out of it he said to prudence an abbess at your age it is worthy of a daughter of france he added in a hard tone prudence flung her arms round trompe la mort's neck and hugged him but the boss flung her off with a sharp blow showing his extraordinary strength and but for paccard the girl's head would have struck and broken the coach window Pause off i don't like such ways said the boss stiffly it is disrespectful to me he is right child said paccard why you see it is as though the boss had made you a present of a hundred thousand francs the shop is worth that it is on the boulevard opposite the gymnase the people come out of the theatre i will do more said trompe la mort i will buy the house and in six years we shall be millionaires cried paccard tired of being interrupted trompe la mort gave paccard's shin a kick hard enough to break it but the man's tendons were of india rubber and his bones of wrought iron all right boss mum it is said he do you think i am cramming you with lies said jacques collin perceiving that paccard had had a few drops too much well listen in the cellar of that house there are two hundred and fifty thousand francs in gold again silence reigned in the coach the coin is in a very hard bed of masonry it must be got out and you have only three nights to do it in jacqueline will help you a hundred thousand francs will buy up the business fifty thousand will pay for the house leave the remainder where said paccard in the cellar asked prudence silence cried jacqueline yes but to get the business transferred we must have the consent of the police authorities paccard objected we shall have it said trompe la mort don't meddle in what does not concern you jacqueline looked at her nephew and was struck by the alteration in his face visible through the stern mask under which the strong man generally hid his feelings you child said he to prudence servien will receive from my aunt the seven hundred and fifty thousand francs seven hundred and thirty said paccard very good seven hundred and thirty then said jacques collin you must return this evening under some pretext to madame lucien's house get out on the roof through the skylight get down the chimney into your missus room and hide the packet she had made of the money in the mattress and why not by the door asked prudence servien idiot there are seals on everything replied jacques collin in a few days the inventory will be taken and you will be innocent of the theft good for the boss cried paccard that is really kind stop coachman cried jacques collin's powerful voice the coach was close to the stand by the jardin des plantes be off young uns said jacques collin and do nothing silly be on the pont des arts this afternoon at five and my aunt will let you know if there are any orders to the contrary we must be prepared for everything he whispered to his aunt to-morrow he went on jacqueline will tell you how to dig up the gold without any risk it is a ticklish job paccard and prudence jumped out on to the king's highway as happy as reprieved thieves what a good fellow the boss is said paccard he would be the king of men if he were not so rough on women 
oh yes he is a sweet creature said paccard did you see how he kicked me well we deserved to be sent to old nick for after all we got him into this scrape if only he does not drag us into some dirty job and get us packed off to the hulks yet said the wily prudence not he if he had that in his head he would tell us you don't know him he has provided handsomely for you here we are citizens at large oh when that man takes a fancy to you he has not his match for good nature now my jewel said jacques collin to his aunt you must take la Gonore in hand she must be humbugged five days hence she will be taken into custody and a hundred and fifty thousand francs will be found in her rooms the remains of a share from the robbery and murder of the old crottat couple the notary's father and mother she will get five years in the madelinette said jacqueline that's about it said the nephew this will be a reason for old nourrisson to get rid of her house she cannot manage it herself and a manager to suit is not to be found every day you can arrange all that we shall have a sharp eye there but all these three things are secondary to the business i have undertaken with regard to our letters so unrip your gown and give me the samples of the goods where are the three packets at la russe's of course coachman cried jacques collin go back to the palais de justice and look sharp i promised to be quick and i have been gone half an hour that is too much stay at la russe's and give the sealed parcels to the office clerk who will come and ask for madame de saint esteve the de will be the password he will say to you madame i have come from the public prosecutor for the things you know of stand waiting outside the door staring about at what is going on in the flower market so as not to arouse prelard's suspicions as soon as you have given up the letters you can start paccard and prudence i see what you are at said jacqueline you mean to step into bibi lupin's shoes that boy's death has turned your brain and there is theodore who was just going to have his hair cropped to be scragged at four this afternoon cried jacques collin well it is a notion we shall end our days as honest folks in a fine property and a delightful climate in touraine what was to become of me lucien has taken my soul with him and all my joy in life i have thirty years before me to be sick of life in and i have no heart left instead of being the boss of the hulks i shall be a figaro of the law and avenge lucien i can never be sure of demolishing corentin excepting in the skin of a police agent and so long as i have a man to devour i shall feel alive the profession a man follows in the eyes of the world is a mere sham the reality is in the idea he added striking his forehead how much have we left in the cash-box he asked nothing said his aunt dismayed by the man's tone and manner i gave you all i had for the boy la romette has not more than twenty thousand francs left in the business i took everything from madame nourrisson she had about sixty thousand francs of her own oh we are lying in sheets that have been washed this twelve months past that boy had all the pals blunt our savings and all old nourrisson's making five hundred and sixty thousand we have a hundred and fifty thousand which paccard and prudence will pay us i will tell you where to find two hundred thousand more the remainder will come to me out of esther's money we must repay old nourrisson with theodore paccard prudence nourrisson and you i shall soon have the holy alliance i require listen now we are nearly there here are the three letters said jacqueline who had finished unsewing the lining of her gown quite right 
said jacques collin taking the three precious documents autograph letters on vellum paper and still strongly scented theodore did the nanterre job oh it was he don't talk time is precious he wanted to give the proceeds to a little corsican sparrow named ginetta you must set old nourrisson to find her i will give you the necessary information in a letter which go will give you come for it to the gate of the conciergerie in two hours time you must place the girl with a washerwoman godet's sister she must seem at home there godet and ruffard were concerned with la Pouraille in robbing and murdering the crottas the four hundred and fifty thousand francs are all safe one third in la gonore's cellar la Pouraille's share the second third in la gonore's bedroom which is ruffard's and the rest is hidden in godet's sister's house we will begin by taking a hundred and fifty thousand francs out of la Pouraille's whack a hundred thousand of godet's and a hundred thousand of ruffard's as soon as godet and ruffard are nabbed they will be supposed to have got rid of what is missing from their shares and i will make godet believe that i have saved a hundred thousand francs for him and that la ganore has done the same for la Pouraille and ruffard prudence and paccard will do the job at la ganore's you and ginetta who seems to be a smart hussy must manage the job at godet's sister's place and so as the first act in the farce i can enable the public prosecutor to lay his hands on four hundred thousand francs stolen from the crottas and on the guilty parties then i shall seem to have shown up the nanterre murderer we shall get back our shiners and are behind the scenes with the police we were the game now we are the hunters that is all give the driver three francs the coach was at the palais jacqueline speechless with astonishment Section 66 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Fautrin's Last Avatar. Chapter 15. A complete change of life is so violent a crisis that Jacques Collin, in spite of his resolution, mounted the steps but slowly going up from the rue de la barillerie to the galerie marchande where under the gloomy peristyle of the courthouse is the entrance to the court itself some civil case was going on which had brought a little crowd together at the foot of the double stairs leading to the assize court so that the convict lost in thought stood for some minutes checked by the throng to the left of this double flight is one of the mainstays of the building like an enormous pillar and in this tower is a little door this door opens on a spiral staircase down to the conciergerie to which the public prosecutor the governor of the prison the presiding judges king's counsel and the chief of the safety department have access by this back way it was up a side staircase from this now walled up that marie antoinette the queen of france was led before the revolutionary tribunal which sat as we all know in the great hall where appeals are now heard before the supreme court the heart sinks within us at the sight of these dreadful steps when we think that marie therese's daughter whose sweet and headdress and hoops filled the great staircase at versailles once passed that way perhaps it was in expiation of her mother's crime the atrocious division of poland the sovereigns who commit such crimes evidently never think of the retribution to be exacted by providence 
when jacques collin went up the vaulted stairs to the public prosecutor's room bibi lupin was just coming out of the little door in the wall the chief of the safety had come from the conciergerie and was also going up to monsieur de granville it was easy to imagine bibi lupin's surprise when he recognized in front of him the gown of carlos herrera which he had so thoroughly studied that morning he ran on to pass him jacques collin turned round and the enemies were face to face each stood still and the self-same look flashed in both pairs of eyes so different in themselves as in a duel two pistols go off at the same instant this time i have got you rascal said the chief of the safety department ah replied jacques collin ironically it flashed through his mind that monsieur de granville had sent some one to watch him and strange to say it pained him to think the magistrate less magnanimous than he had supposed bibi lupin bravely flew at jacques collin's throat but he keeping his eye on the foe gave him a straight blow and sent him sprawling on his back three yards off then trompe la mort went calmly up to bibi lupin and held out a hand to help him rise exactly like an english boxer who sure of his superiority is ready for more bibi lupin knew better than to call out but he sprang to his feet ran to the entrance to the passage and signed to a gendarme to stand on guard then swift as lightning he came back to the foe who quietly looked on jacques collin had decided what to do either the public prosecutor has broken his word or he had not taken bibi lupin into his confidence and in that case i must get the matter explained thought he do you mean to arrest me he asked his enemy say so without more ado don't i know that in the heart of this place you are stronger than i am i could kill you with a well-placed kick but i could not tackle the gendarmes and the soldiers now make no noise where do you want to take me to monsieur camusot come along to monsieur camusot replied jacques collin why should we not go to the public prosecutor's court it is nearer he added bibi lupin who knew that he was out of favor with the upper ranks of judicial authorities and suspected of having made a fortune at the expense of criminals and their victims was not unwilling to show himself in court with so notable a capture all right we will go there said he but as you surrender allow me to fit you with bracelets i am afraid of your claws and he took the handcuffs out of his pocket jacques collin held out his hands and bibi lupin snapped on the manacles well now since you are feeling so good said he tell me how you got out of the conciergerie by the way you came down the turret stairs then have you taught the gendarmes some new trick no monsieur de granville let me out on parole you are gammoning me you will see perhaps it will be your turn to wear the bracelets just then corentin was saying to monsieur de granville well monsieur it is just an hour since our man set out are you not afraid that he may have fooled you he is on the road to spain perhaps by this time and we shall not find him there for spain is a whimsical kind of country either i know nothing of men or he will come back he is bound by every interest he has more to look for at my hands than he has to give bibi lupin walked in monsieur le comte said he i have good news for you jacques collin who had escaped has been recaptured and this said jacques collin addressing monsieur de granville is the way you keep your word ask your double-faced agent where he took me where said the public prosecutor close to the court in the vaulted passage said bibi lupin 
take your irons off the man said m de granville sternly and remember that you are to leave him free till further orders go you have a way of moving and acting as if you alone were law and police in one the public prosecutor turned his back on bibi lupin who became deadly pale especially at a look from jacques collin in which he read disaster i have not been out of this room i expected you back and you cannot doubt that i have kept my word as you kept yours said m de granville to the convict for a moment i did doubt you sir and in my place perhaps you would have thought as i did but on reflection i saw that i was unjust i bring you more than you can give me you had no interest in betraying me the magistrate flashed a look at corentin this glance which could not escape trompe la mort who was watching m de granville directed his attention to the strange little old man sitting in an armchair in a corner warned at once by the swift and anxious instinct that scents the presence of an enemy collin examined this figure he saw at a glance that the eyes were not so old as the costume would suggest and he detected a disguise in one second jacques collin was revenged on corentin for the rapid insight with which corentin had unmasked him at peyrade's we are not alone said jacques collin to m de granville no said the magistrate dryly and this gentleman is one of my oldest acquaintances i believe replied the convict he went forward recognizing corentin the real and confessed originator of lucien's overthrow jacques collin whose face was of a brick-red hue for a scarcely perceptible moment turned white almost ashy all his blood rushed to his heart so furious and maddening was his longing to spring on this dangerous reptile and crush it but he controlled the brutal impulse suppressing it with the force that made him so formidable he put on a polite manner and the tone of obsequious civility which he had practised since assuming the garb of a priest of a superior order and he bowed to the little old man monsieur corentin said he do i owe the pleasure of this meeting to chance or am i so happy as to be the cause of your visit here monsieur de granville's astonishment was at its height and he could not help staring at the two men who had thus come face to face jacques collin's behavior and the tone in which he spoke denoted a crisis and he was curious to know the meaning of it on being thus suddenly and miraculously recognized corentin drew himself up like a snake when you tread on its tail yes it is i my dear abbe carlos herrera and are you here said trompe la mort to interfere between monsieur the public prosecutor and me am i so happy as to be the object of one of those negotiations in which your talents shine so brightly here monsieur le comte the convict went on not to waste time so precious as yours is read these they are samples of my wares and he held out to monsieur de granville three letters which he took out of his breast pocket and while you are studying them i will with your permission have a little talk with this gentleman you do me great honor said corentin who could not help giving a little shiver you achieved a perfect success in our business said jacques collin i was beaten he added lightly in the tone of a gambler who has lost his money but you left some men on the field your victory cost you dear yes said corentin taking up the jest you lost your queen and i lost my two castles oh contenson was a mere pawn 
said jacques collin scornfully you may easily replace him you really are allow me to praise you to your face you are on my word of honour a magnificent man no no i bow to your superiority replied corentin assuming the air of a professional joker as if he said if you mean humbug by all means humbug i have everything at my command while you are single-handed so to speak oh oh said jacques collin and you were very near winning the day said corentin noticing the exclamation you are quite the most extraordinary man i ever met in my life and i have seen many very extraordinary men for those i have to work with me are all remarkable for daring and bold scheming i was for my sins very intimate with the late duc d'otrento i have worked for louis the eighteenth when he was on the throne and when he was exiled for the emperor and for the directory you have the tenacity of louvel the best political instrument i ever met with but you are as supple as the prince of diplomats and what auxiliaries you have i would give many a head to the guillotine if i could have in my service the cook who lived with poor little esther and where do you find such beautiful creatures as the woman who took the jewess's place for monsieur de nucingen i don't know where to get them when i want them monsieur monsieur you overpower me said jacques collin such praise from you will turn my head it is deserved why you took in peyrade he believed you to be a police officer he i tell you what if you had not that fool of a boy to take care of you would have thrashed us oh monsieur but you are forgetting contenson disguised as a mulatto and peyrade as an englishman actors have the stage to help them but to be so perfect by daylight and at all hours no one but you and your men come now said corentin we are fully convinced of our worth and merits and here we stand each of us quite alone i have lost my old friend you your young companion i for the moment am in the stronger position why should we not do like the men in l'auberge des adres i offer you my hand and say let us embrace and let bygones be bygones here in the presence of monsieur le comte i propose to give you full and plenary absolution and you shall be one of my men the chief next to me and perhaps my successor you really offer me a situation said jacques collin a nice situation indeed out of the fire into the frying-pan you will be in a sphere where your talents will be highly appreciated and well paid for and you will act at your ease the government police are not free from perils i as you see me have already been imprisoned twice but i am none the worse for that and we travel we are what we choose to appear we pull the wires of political dramas and are treated with politeness by very great people come my dear jacques collin do you say yes have you orders to act in this matter said the convict i have a free hand replied corentin delighted at his own happy idea you are trifling with me you are very shrewd and you must allow that a man may be suspicious of you you have sold more than one man by tying him up in a sack after making him go into it of his own accord i know all your great victories the montaurin case the simeuse business the battles of marengo of espionage well said corentin you have some esteem for the public prosecutor yes said jacques collin bowing respectfully i admire his noble character his firmness his dignity i would give my life to make him happy indeed to begin with 
i will put an end to the dangerous condition in which madame de serizy now is monsieur de granville turned to him with a look of satisfaction then ask him corentin went on if i have not full power to snatch you from the degrading position in which you stand and to attach you to me it is quite true said monsieur de granville watching the convict really and truly i may have absolution for the past and a promise of succeeding to you if i give sufficient evidence of my intelligence between two such men as we are there can be no misunderstanding said corentin with a lordly air that might have taken anybody in and the price of the bargain is i suppose the surrender of those three packets of letters said jacques collin i did not think it would be necessary to say so to you my dear monsieur corentin said trompe la mort with irony worthy of that which made the fame of talma in the part of nicomede i beg to decline i am indebted to you for the knowledge of what i am worth and of the importance you attach to seeing me deprived of my weapons i will never forget it at all times and for ever i shall be at your service but instead of saying with robert macaire let us embrace i embrace you he seized corentin round the middle so suddenly that the other could not avoid the hug he clutched him to his heart like a doll kissed him on both cheeks carried him like a feather with one hand while with the other he opened the door and then set him down outside quite battered by this rough treatment good-bye my dear fellow said jacques collin in a low voice and in corentin's ear the length of three corpses parts you from me we have measured swords they are of the same temper and the same length let us treat each other with due respect but i mean to be your equal not your subordinate armed as you would be it strikes me you would be too dangerous a general for your lieutenant we will place a grave between us woe to you if you come over on to my territory you call yourself the state as footmen call themselves by their master's names for my part i will call myself justice we shall often meet let us treat each other with dignity and propriety all the more because we shall always remain atrocious blackguards he added in a whisper i set you the example by embracing you corentin stood nonplussed for the first time in his life and allowed his terrible antagonist to wring his hand if so said he i think it will be to our interest on both sides to remain chums we shall be stronger each on our own side but at the same time more dangerous added jacques collin in an undertone and you will allow me to call on you to-morrow to ask for some pledge of our agreement well well said corentin amiably you are taking the case out of my hands to place it in those of the public prosecutor you will help him to promotion but i cannot but own to you that you are acting wisely bibi lupin is too well known he has served his turn if you get his place you will have the only situation that suits you i am delighted to see you in it on my honor Section sixty seven of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Vautrin's Last Avatar. Chapter sixteen. 
on turning round trompe la mort saw the public prosecutor sitting at his table his head resting on his hands do you mean that you can save the comtesse de serizy from going mad asked monsieur de granville in five minutes said jacques collin and you can give me all those ladies letters have you read the three yes said the magistrate vehemently and i blush for the women who wrote them well we are now alone admit no one and let us come to terms said jacques collin excuse me justice must first take its course monsieur camusot has instructions to seize your aunt he will never find her said jacques collin search is to be made at the temple in the shop of a demoiselle Pacard, who superintends her shop nothing will be found there but rags costumes diamonds uniforms however it will be as well to check monsieur camusot's zeal monsieur de granville rang and sent an office messenger to desire monsieur camusot to come and speak with him now said he to jacques collin an end to all this i want to know your recipe for curing the countess monsieur le comte said the convict very gravely i was as you know sentenced to five years penal servitude for forgery but i love my liberty this passion like every other had defeated its own end for lovers who insist on adoring each other too fondly and by quarrelling by dint of escaping and being recaptured alternately i have served seven years on the hulks so you have nothing to remit but the added terms i earned in quad i beg pardon in prison i have in fact served my time and till some ugly job can be proved against me which i defy justice to do or even corentin i ought to be reinstated in my rights as a french citizen what is life if i am banned from paris and subject to the eye of the police where can i go what can i do you know my capabilities you have seen corentin that storehouse of treachery and wile turn ghastly pale before me and doing justice to my powers that man has bereft me of everything for it was he and he alone who overthrew the edifice of lucien's fortunes by what means and in whose interest i know not corentin and camusot did it all no recriminations said monsieur de granville give me the facts well then these are the facts last night as i held in my hand the icy hand of that dead youth i vowed to myself that i would give up the mad contest i have kept up for twenty years past against society at large you will not believe me capable of religious sentimentality after what i have said of my religious opinions still in these twenty years i have seen a great deal of the seamy side of the world i have known its back stairs and i have discerned in the march of events a power which you call providence and i call chance and which my companions call luck every evil deed however quickly it may hide its traces is overtaken by some retribution in this struggle for existence when the game is going well when you have quentin cator's in your hand and the lead the candle tumbles over and the cards are burned or the player has a fit of apoplexy that is lucien's story that boy that angel had not committed the shadow of a crime he let himself be led he let things go he was to marry mademoiselle de grandlieu to be made marquis he had a fine fortune well a prostitute poisons herself she hides the price of a certificate of stock and the whole structure so laboriously built up crumbles in an instant and who is the first man to deal a blow a man loaded with secret infamy 
a monster who in the world of finance has committed such crimes that every coin of his vast fortune has been dipped in the tears of a whole family see la maison nucingen by nucingen who has been a legalized jacques collin in the world of money however you know as well as i do all the bankruptcies and tricks for which that man deserves hanging my fetters will leave a mark on all my actions however virtuous to be a shuttlecock between two rackets one called the hulks and the other the police is a life in which success means never-ending toil and peace and quiet seem quite impossible at this moment monsieur de granville jacques collin is buried with lucien who is being now sprinkled with holy water and carried away to pere lachaise what i want is a place not to live in but to die in as things are you representing justice have never cared to make the released convict's social status a concern of any interest though the law may be satisfied society is not society is still suspicious and does all it can to justify its suspicions it regards a released convict as an impossible creature it ought to restore him to his full rights but in fact it prohibits his living in certain circles society says to the poor wretch paris which is the only place you can be hidden in paris and its suburbs for so many miles round is the forbidden land you shall not live there and it subjects the convict to the watchfulness of the police do you think that life is possible under such conditions to live the convict must work for he does not come out of prison with a fortune you arrange matters so that he is plainly ticketed recognized hedged round and then you fancy that his fellow-citizens will trust him when society and justice and the world around him do not you condemn him to starvation or crime he cannot get work and is inevitably dragged into his old ways which lead to the scaffold thus while earnestly wishing to give up this struggle with the law i could find no place for myself under the sun one course alone is open to me that is to become the servant of the power that crushes us and as soon as this idea dawned on me the power of which i spoke was shown in the clearest light three great families are at my mercy do not suppose i am thinking of blackmail blackmail is the meanest form of murder in my eyes it is baser villainy than murder the murderer needs at any rate atrocious courage and i practice what i preach for the letters which are my safe conduct which allow me to address you thus and for the moment place me on an equality with you i crime and you justice those letters are in your power your messenger may fetch them and they will be given up to him i ask no price for them i do not sell them alas monsieur le comte i was not thinking of myself when i preserved them i thought that lucien might some day be in danger if you cannot agree to my request my courage is out i hate life more than enough to make me blow out my own brains and rid you of me or with a passport i can go to america and live in the wilderness i have all the characteristics of a savage these are the thoughts that came to me in the night your clerk no doubt carried you a message i sent by him when i saw what precautions you took to save lucien's memory from any stain i dedicated my life to you a poor offering for i no longer cared for it it seemed to me impossible without the star that gave it light 
the happiness that glorified it the thought that gave it meaning the prosperity of the young poet who was its son and i determined to give you the three packets of letters monsieur de granville bowed his head i went down into the prison-yard and there i found the persons guilty of the nanterre crime as well as my little chain companion within an inch of the chopper as an involuntary accessory after the fact jacques collin went on i discovered that bibi lupin is cheating the authorities that one of his men murdered the crottas was not this providential as you say so i perceived a remote possibility of doing good of turning my gifts and the dismal experience i have gained to account for the benefit of society of being useful instead of mischievous and i ventured to confide in your judgment your generosity the man's air of candor of artlessness of childlike simplicity as he made his confession without bitterness or that philosophy of vice which had hitherto made him so terrible to hear was like an absolute transformation he was no longer himself i have such implicit trust in you he went on with the humility of a penitent that i am wholly at your mercy you see me with three roads open to me suicide america and the rue de jerusalem bibi lupin is rich he has served his turn he is a double-faced rascal and if you set me to work against him i would catch him red-handed in some trick within a week if you will put me in that sneak's shoes you will do society a real service i will be honest i have every quality that is needed in the profession i am better educated than bibi lupin i went through my schooling up to rhetoric i shall not blunder as he does i have very good manners when i choose my sole ambition is to become an instrument of order and repression instead of being the incarnation of corruption i will enlist no more recruits to the army of vice in war monsieur when a hostile general is captured he is not shot you know his sword is returned to him and his prison is a large town well i am the general of the hulks and i have surrendered i am beaten not by the law but by death the sphere in which i crave to live and act is the only one that is suited to me and there i can develop the powers i feel within me decide and jacques collin stood in an attitude of diffident submission you place the letters in my hands then said the public prosecutor you have only to send for them they will be delivered to your messenger but how jacques collin read the magistrate's mind and kept up the game you promised me to commute the capital sentence on calvi for twenty years penal servitude oh i am not reminding you of that to drive a bargain he added eagerly seeing m de granville's expression that life should be safe for other reasons the lad is innocent how am i to get the letters asked the public prosecutor it is my right and my business to convince myself that you are the man you say you are i must have you without conditions send a man you can trust to the flower market on the quay at the door of a tin man's shop under the sign of achilles shield that house yes said jacques collin smiling bitterly my shield is there your man will see an old woman dressed as i told you before like a fishwoman who has saved money earrings in her ears and clothes like a rich market woman's he must ask for madame de saint esteve 
do not omit the de and he must say i have come from the public prosecutor to fetch you know what you will immediately receive three sealed packets all the letters are there said monsieur de granville there is no tricking you you did not get your place for nothing said jacques collin with a smile i see you still think me capable of testing you and giving you so much blank paper no you do not know me said he i trust you as a son trusts his father you will be taken back to the conciergerie said the magistrate and there await a decision as to your fate Monsieur de Granville rang and said to the office boy who answered, Beg Monsieur Garnery to come here if he is in his room. Besides the forty eight police commissioners who watch over Paris like forty eight petty providences, to say nothing of the guardians of public safety, and who have earned the nickname of Cardoy in thieves slang, a quarter of an eye, because there are four of them to each district, besides these there are two commissioners attached equally to the police and to the legal authorities whose duty it is to undertake delicate negotiation and not frequently to serve as deputies to the examining judges the office of these two magistrates for police commissioners are also magistrates is known as the delegates office for they are in fact delegated on each occasion and formally empowered to carry out inquiries or arrests these functions demand men of ripe age proved intelligence great rectitude and perfect discretion and it is one of the miracles wrought by heaven in favor of paris that some men of that stamp are always forthcoming any description of the palais de justice would be incomplete without due mention of these preventive officials as they may be called the most powerful adjuncts of the law for though it must be owned that the force of circumstances has abrogated the ancient pomp and wealth of justice it has materially gained in many ways in paris especially its machinery is admirably perfect M. de Granville had sent his secretary, M. de Chargebeuf, to attend Lucien's funeral. He needed a substitute for this business, a man he could trust, and M. Garnery was one of the commissioners in the delegate's office. Monsieur, said Jacques Collin, I have already proved to you that I have a sense of honor. You let me go free, and I came back by this time the funeral mass for lucien is ended they will be carrying him to the grave instead of remanding me to the conciergerie give me leave to follow the boy's body to pere lachaise i will come back and surrender myself prisoner go said monsieur de granville in the kindest tone one word more monsieur the money belonging to that girl lucien's mistress was not stolen during the short time of liberty you allowed me i questioned her servants i am sure of them as you are of your two commissioners of the delegate's office the money paid for the certificate sold by mademoiselle esther gobseck will certainly be found in her room when the seals are removed her maid remarked to me that the deceased was given to mystery-making and very distrustful. She no doubt hid the banknotes in her bed. Let the bedstead be carefully examined and taken to pieces, the mattresses unsewn. The money will be found. You are sure of that? I am sure of the relative honesty of my rascals. They never play any tricks on me i hold the power of life and death i try and condemn them and carry out my sentence without all your formalities you can see for yourself the results of my authority i will recover the money stolen from monsieur and madame crottat i will hand you over one of bibi lupin's men 
his right hand caught in the act and i will tell you the secret of the nanterre murders this is not a bad beginning and if you only employ me in the service of the law and the police by the end of a year you will be satisfied with all i can tell you i will be thoroughly all that i ought to be and shall manage to succeed in all the business that is placed in my hands i can promise you nothing but my good will what you ask is not in my power the privilege of granting pardons is the king's alone on the recommendation of the keeper of the seals and the place you wish to hold is in the gift of the prefet of police monsieur garnery the office boy announced at a nod from monsieur de granville the delegate commissioner came in glanced at jacques collin as one who knows and gulped down his astonishment on hearing the word go spoken to jacques collin by monsieur de granville allow me said jacques collin to remain here till monsieur garnery has returned with the documents in which all my strength lies that i may take away with me some expression of your satisfaction this absolute humility and sincerity touched the public prosecutor go said he i can depend on you jacques collin bowed humbly with the submissiveness of an inferior to his master ten minutes later monsieur de granville was in possession of the letters in three sealed packets that had not been opened but the importance of this point and jacques collin's avowal had made him Section sixty eight of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Vautrin's Last Avatar. Chapter seventeen. When once he was outside, Jacques Collin had an indescribable sense of satisfaction. He felt he was free and born to a new phase of life he walked quickly from the palais to the church of saint germain des prés where mass was over the coffin was being sprinkled with holy water and he arrived in time thus to bid farewell in a christian fashion to the mortal remains of the youth he had loved so well then he got into a carriage and drove after the body to the cemetery in paris unless on very exceptional occasions or when some famous man has died a natural death the crowd that gathers about a funeral diminishes by degrees as the procession approaches pere lachaise people make time to show themselves in church but every one has his business to attend to and returns to it as soon as possible thus of ten mourning carriages only four were occupied by the time they reached pere lachaise there were not more than a dozen followers among whom was rastignac that is right it is well that you are faithful to him said jacques collin to his old acquaintance rastignac started with surprise at seeing vautrin be calm said his old fellow boarder at madame vauquer's i am your slave if only because i find you here my help is not to be despised i am or shall be more powerful than ever you slipped your cable and you did it very cleverly but you may need me yet and i will always be at your service but what are you going to do to supply the hulks with lodgers instead of lodging there replied jacques collin rastignac gave a shrug of disgust but if you were robbed rastignac hurried on to get away from jacques collin you do not know what circumstances you may find yourself in they stood by the grave dug by the side of esther's 
two beings who loved each other and who were happy said jacques collin they are united it is some comfort to rot together i will be buried here when lucien's body was lowered into the grave jacques collin fell in a dead faint this strong man could not endure the light rattle of the spadefuls of earth thrown by the grave-diggers on the coffin as a hint for their payment just then two men of the corps of public safety came up they recognized jacques collin lifted him up and carried him to a hackney coach what is up now asked jacques collin when he recovered consciousness and had looked about him he saw himself between two constables one of whom was ruffard and he gave him a look which pierced the murderer's soul to the very depths of la Gonore's secret why the public prosecutor wants you replied ruffard and we have been hunting for you everywhere and found you in the cemetery where you had nearly taken a header into that boy's grave jacques collin was silent for a moment is it bibi lupin that is after me he asked the other man no monsieur garnery sent us to find you and he told you nothing the two men looked at each other holding counsel in expressive pantomime come what did he say when he gave you your orders he bid us fetch you at once said ruffard and said we should find you at the church of saint germain des prés or if the funeral had left the church at the cemetery the public prosecutor wants me perhaps that is it said jacques collin he wants my assistance and he relapsed into silence which greatly puzzled the two constables at about half-past two jacques collin once more went up to monsieur de granville's room and found there a fresh arrival in the person of monsieur de granville's predecessor the comte d'octave de bauvan one of the presidents of the court of appeals you forgot madame de serizy's dangerous condition and that you had promised to save her ask these rascals in what state they found me monsieur said jacques collin signing to the two constables to come in unconscious monsieur lying on the edge of the grave of the young man they were burying save madame de serizy said the comte de bauvan and you shall have what you will i ask for nothing said jacques collin i surrendered at discretion and monsieur de granville must have received all the letters yes said the magistrate but you promised to save madame de serizy's reason can you was it not a vain boast i hope i can replied jacques collin modestly well then come with me said comte octave no monsieur i will not be seen in the same carriage by your side i am still a convict it is my wish to serve the law i will not begin by discrediting it go back to the countess i will be there soon after you tell her lucien's best friend is coming to see her the abbe carlos herrera the anticipation of my visit will make an impression on her and favor the cure you will forgive me for assuming once more the false part of a spanish priest it is to do so much good i shall find you there at about four o'clock said monsieur de granville for i have to wait on the king with the keeper of the seals jacques collin went off to find his aunt who was waiting for him on the quai aux fleurs so you have given yourself up to the authorities said she yes it is a risky game no i owed that poor theodore his life and he is reprieved and you i i shall be what i ought to be i shall always make our set shake in their shoes but we must get to work go and tell paccard to be off as fast as he can go and see that europe does as i told her that is a trifle i know how to deal with la Gonore, said the terrible jacqueline 
I have not been wasting my time here among the gilly-flowers. Let Janetta, the Corsican girl, be found by to-morrow, Jacques Collin went on, smiling at his aunt. I shall want some clue. You can get it through Manon la Blonde, said Jacques. Then we meet this evening, replied the aunt. You are in such a deuce of a hurry. Is there a fat job on? I want to begin with a stroke that will beat everything that Bibi Lupin has ever done. I have spoken a few words to the brute who killed Lucien, and I live only for revenge. Thanks to our positions, he and I shall be equally strong, equally protected. It will take years to strike the blow, but the wretch shall have it straight in the heart. He must have vowed a Roland for your Oliver, said the aunt, for he has taken charge of Peyrade's daughter, the girl who was sold to Madame Nourrisson, you know. Our first point must be to find him a servant. That will be difficult. He must be tolerably wide awake, observed Jacqueline well hatred keeps one alive we must work hard jacques collin took a cab and drove at once to the quai malaquais to the little room he lodged in quite separate from lucien's apartment the porter greatly astonished at seeing him wanted to tell him all that had happened i know everything said the abbe i have been involved in it in spite of my saintly reputation but thanks to the intervention of the spanish ambassador i have been released he hurried up to his room where from under the cover of a breviary he took out a letter that lucien had written to madame de serizy after that lady had discarded him on seeing him at the opera with esther Lucien, in his despair, had decided on not sending this letter, believing himself cast off forever. But Jacques Collin had read the little masterpiece, and as all that Lucien wrote was to him sacred, he had treasured the letter in his prayer-book for its poetical expression of a passion that was chiefly vanity. When M. de Granville told him of Madame de Serizy's condition, the keen-witted man had very wisely concluded that this fine lady's despair and frenzy must be the result of the quarrel she had allowed to subsist between herself and lucien he knew women as magistrates know criminals he guessed the most secret impulses of their hearts and he at once understood that the countess probably ascribed lucien's death partly to her own severity and reproached herself bitterly obviously a man on whom she had shed her love would never have thrown away his life to know that he had loved her still in spite of her cruelty might restore her reason if jacques collin was a grand general of convicts he was it must be owned a not less skilful physician of souls this man's arrival at the mansion of the serizes was at once a disgrace and a promise several persons the count and the doctors were assembled in the little drawing-room adjoining the countess's bedroom but to spare him this stain on his soul's honour the comte de bauvan dismissed everybody and remained alone with his friend it was bad enough even then for the vice-president of the privy council to see this gloomy and sinister visitor come in jacques collin had changed his dress he was in black with trousers and a plain frock-coat and his gait his look and his manner were all that could be wished he bowed to the two statesmen and asked if he might be admitted to see the countess she awaits you with impatience said m de bauvan with impatience then she is saved said the dreadful magician and in fact after an interview of half an hour jacques collin opened the door and said come in monsieur le comte there is nothing further to fear the countess had the letter clasped to her heart she was calm and seemed to have forgiven herself 
the count gave expression to his joy at the sight and these are the men who settle our fate and the fate of nations thought jacques collin shrugging his shoulders behind the two men a female has but to sigh in the wrong way to turn their brain as if it were a glove a wink and they lose their head a petticoat raised a little higher dropped a little lower and they rush round paris in despair the whims of a woman react on the whole country ah how much stronger is a man when like me he keeps far away from this childish tyranny from honour ruined by passion from this frank malignity and wiles worthy of savages woman with her genius for ruthlessness her talent for torture is and always will be the marring of man the public prosecutor the minister here they are all hoodwinked all moving the spheres for some letters written by a duchess and a chit or to save the reason of a woman who is more crazy in her right mind than she was in her delirium and he smiled haughtily ay said he to himself and they believe in me they act on my information and will leave me in power i shall still rule the world which has obeyed me these five-and-twenty years jacques collin had brought into play the overpowering influence he had exerted of yore over poor esther for he had as has often been shown the mode of speech the look the action which quell madmen and he had depicted lucien as having died with the countess's image in his heart no woman can resist the idea of having been the one beloved you now have no rival had been this bitter jester's last words he remained a whole hour alone and forgotten in that little room m de granville arrived and found him gloomy standing up and lost in a brown study as a man may well be who makes an eighteenth brumaire in his life the public prosecutor went to the door of the countess's room and remained there a few minutes then he turned to jacques collin and said you have not changed your mind no monsieur well then you will take bibi lupin's place and calvi's sentence will be commuted and he is not to be sent to rochefort not even to toulon you may employ him in your service but these reprieves and your appointment depend on your conduct for the next six months as subordinate to bibi lupin Within a week Bibi Lupin's new deputy had helped the Crottat family to recover four hundred thousand francs, and had brought Ruffard and Godet to justice. The price of the certificate sold by Esther Gobseck was found in the courtesan's mattress, and Monsieur de Serizy handed over to Jacques Collin the three hundred thousand francs left to him by Lucien de Rubempre. The monument, erected by Lucien's orders for Esther and himself, is considered one of the finest in Père Lachaise, and the earth beneath it belongs to Jacques Collin. After exercising his functions for about fifteen years, Jacques Collin retired in 1845. End of section